All right, everybody, welcome to our tree mob. Um, today we are talking about parasitic plants of the Arnold Arboretum. My name is Sarah Neckerman. I'm going to be hosting the Zoom side of this. I'm a program manager here. Um, but our real star of the show, our speaker today is Dr. Ned Friedman, who is the director of the Arnold Arboretum, as well as an Arnold professor of organismic and evolutionary biology. Uh, this is a hybrid tree mob, so we have people in person as well as you all virtual. Um, if you have questions for Ned as we go along, please put those in the Q&A and we will address those uh, as many as we can at the end, maybe some during the, the middle parts too if we have some downtime. A couple notes about this particular tree mob. The first is that it is going to be kind of mobile. We're going to be following Ned as he takes us around the Arboretum and shows us different plants. Um, and the, the service can go in and out, so just bear with us with that. Um, and I will be showing some uh, pictures of the plants that we we're looking at so you can get a good look at those. So I will be sharing my screen when that happens. So note that that is going to happen as well. Uh, and without further ado, I am going to pass it back over to Ned. Ned, whenever you're ready, and I will unmute you. All right, everyone. Welcome. This is the nicest day we've had in months, I believe. And it's only because we're talking about parasitic plants that the weather's cooperating. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Ned Friedman. Um, I'm a botanist. I'm actually a professor at Harvard. Uh, so I'm also the director of the Young Arboretum, but I love plants in every kind of way that you can imagine. Um, but recently, I've been obsessing about parasites. And you hear this word parasite, and you think, oh, definitely a bad thing. But I'm going to here to convince you today that plants that are parasitic are really interesting, of course, to begin with, but they're also really beautiful and there's nothing wrong with them. Um, there can be parasites, for example, that are parasites of, for example, human food crops. That's not a good thing. And we don't want to celebrate those today. Uh, but the ones that we're going to talk about that are here in the Arnold Arboretum are just wonderful. So the first thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about what a plant parasite is and the different flavors of plant parasites. So um, there actually is a range of how much theft can go on. There are some parasites that are actually stealing water and mineral nutrients from whatever they've tapped into. And they're not taking a lot of carbon, but they are taking some, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. And they're referred to as hemiparasites. And the reason they're hemi or half or part is because they actually still are able to photosynthesize. They are green plants. And if you looked at them, you would say, yeah, nice plant, beautiful flowers. Uh, but if you sort of scruffed around with your fingers and got down to their roots, you'd find that their roots were glommed on to someone else. And that those roots actually send what are called hostoria, little filaments. They actually glue themselves onto the host and then they drill in and then what they do is they tap into the big pipe system that moves water and they pull that water and whatever is dissolved in it, including some organic materials that have carbon into their body. Uh, so these are these hemiparasites, but they could have hundreds of little things out there under the soil and they're pulling from someone else and they will be green. Now, holoparasites, completely parasites, you'll look at them and you'll say, yeah, that's gotta be a parasite because it's not green. Uh, it's going to be white, it'll be maybe pinkish, but you'll see no green coloration. And they are stealing two things for sure, water and dissolved mineral nutrients, and they're also going to be dissolved, uh, uh, stealing um, uh, the, the carbon from the plant. And when they're tapped into a plant, a holoparasite like that, they actually, their little sinkers, not only do they sink into the pipes that move water, they also sink into the pipes that move sugars. So they're even more complicated because what you have to do if you're going to tap into a host plant, one of two things, you're either going to just tap in one way, which is into the water system, or a second way, which is water and dissolved sugars. And they're even more complicated under the microscopes. They're really beautiful. And they're really interesting because you've got to coordinate how you grow and you have to be able to actually align your pipe system with a totally different species, totally unrelated to you. So there's some learning involved here or actually a lot of evolution. On their part? Hmm? Uh, yeah, on their part. <laughs> they have to learn a lot. Now, there are plants that you're going to see that are totally achlorophilous without chlorophyll that are not actually parasitic directly on another plant. And they actually have an intermediary. 
And that's where we start with our first uh, set of parasites. Now, this is called uh, the uh, Indian pipe. Oh yeah, you can hold on to that for a second. And um, this is a wonderful plant. Uh, hold on to that for a second. I have lots of props. But if you can see here, uh, these are beautiful. It's also called the ghost plant. Um, and what you can see here with the ghost plant is it's completely without chlorophyll. And I can guarantee you that the ghost plants behind me are basically recycling the carbon from these hemlocks. So, but they're not hooked up to the hemlock. So how do you think they get the carbon? Fungi. So you know most plants have fungal partners that help them get more nutrients from the soil. They're called mycorrhizal fungi. Well, if you're sneaky, you have the same mycorrhizal fungus as another plant. And instead of the mycorrhizal fungus getting all the carbon and then trading that for nutrients that the, that the host plant, they just keep the carbon moving and into their body. And that's exactly what this beautiful, beautiful ghost plant does. It's not attached to any of these hemlocks, but all of the carbon in it came from these hemlocks. And if you look, they are, these are the flowers of these beautiful nodding uh, white structures. They can be uh, a little bit on the pink side. So uh, they're just magnificent plants. And um, I'll just show you, I did a post on them years ago. And then I'll just segue now. I just want to tell you just quickly, who do you think loved ghost plants more than almost anybody else? Uh, not a bad, well, that's because of my obsession with Darwin. Everyone's, everyone's thinking it's gotta be Darwin. And uh, close, but not right. Actually, Emily Dickinson, it was her favorite flower. And uh, here's a poem she wrote. White as an Indian pipe, red as a cardinal flower, fabulous as a moon at noon, February hour. She wrote that about 1873. And she received actually a piece of artwork from uh, I think it was her brother-in-law, uh, his, his love, uh, I mean, his brother, uh, her, his lover painted her a picture of these flowers. And she wrote back that without suspecting it, you should send me the preferred flower of life seems almost supernatural. And the sweet glee that I felt at meeting it, I could confide to none. Isn't that great? And after Emily Dickinson died, the first book of her published poems, pu published posthumously, has the Indian pipe on the cover. So there's a wonderful story about this, what, this plant that steals carbon from a fungus that's hooked up to another plant. And this is uh, Monotropa, uh, the Indian pipe. And what? Not a thing. <laughs> yeah. The, the heads that are nodding over are actually the flowers. And if you were to look up into them, you'd see the uh, pollen producing organs and you'd see the, the female parts that receive them. And ultimately they mature into a little capsule-like structure with seeds that then disperse. And they would disperse into this stuff. I'm sorry? Uh, they're, they're, well, so now you're saying, why isn't Ned showing me the actual plant? Couldn't I be watching this online? Well, I came out here two weeks ago to scout the, uh, the Indian pipes. And sadly, uh, in the two weeks of drought since then, they came up, they were magnificent. They turned to toast. So I'm gonna show you the actual Indian pipes. We're gonna go over here, but they're black and they're not, they're not gonna look so great. So hence this one, this is the drought in New England, but this is what happened. See one, two, three, and four. And uh, for those of you online, uh, these were this beautiful pink two weeks ago. I was so excited. That's why I wanted to do a tree mob on parasites. And then we have had uh, over the course of 11 weeks this summer, we got a little over three inches of rain. So we're talking about desert conditions here. And these things uh, basically just didn't have enough water to get to maturity. So they literally dried up in place. So they're not gonna be reproductive. Uh, my hope is that there's enough of a seed bank in here that didn't germinate because it was dry, that next year we'll be back in action. But come here next August, keep your eye out for these beautiful things. Now, the other thing I want to introduce everyone to online as well as here, we have uh, some, sh is that about a hundred years ago, there was a wonderful botanist and taxonomist, uh, uh, Ernest Palmer, who worked here. And he spent a number of years documenting what is called the spontaneous flora of the Arnold Arboretum. In other words, we know all our trees, they all have tags. Everybody has got a place and a record, but we don't really keep track of herbaceous plants. And he went around 
and he made herbarium sheet pressings of all of our herbaceous plants. And you can see, this is a copy of the herbarium sheet that Ernest uh, E.J. Palmer made of the ghost plant. And you can see he pulled them out. You can see pretty minimal root systems. Hence, they probably had a really tough time. And here you can see on the label, it says herbarium of the Arnold Arboretum. These are in our Honeywell building in the herbarium. And it says grassy open woods, Juglins collection. Now, I, I have not seen them in our walnut collection, but again, you know, look for some of those wildflower areas. And, and I encourage everyone who can get here, I want all of you to be my eyes on the grounds for parasitic plants, uh, because I'm gonna tell you that some of the things that Palmer saw, we don't know if they're still here, but I haven't covered every square foot. So I have an ulterior motive here, which is I want another 50 people looking for parasitic plants. And if you find them, take a picture, send me, and we'll meet out there and uh, I'll be thrilled to see them. But this is a wonderful herbarium sheet. And um, it says a hundred years ago, this is where it was. Um, and um, I, would, I would have made an herbarium sheet this year, but uh, these aren't so great. So next year I'll make an herbarium sheet. So I believe they're all annuals. So basically, uh, again, they're gonna die, they'll disperse their seeds and the seeds will germinate, they will get their, their, they'll tap into these fungi immediately, and then they'll just start moving carbon into their bodies. Yeah, so the fungi are here, uh, they're continuing to penetrate all over the place, they're continuing to expand as new roots are grown on our hemlocks and other trees. Uh, they're, they're, they're certainly alive and well and going through from year to year. Yeah, so uh, the question is, are these in the seed bank? My hope is that, Last year's crop left enough seeds and it was so dry, most of them didn't uh, germinate. And as a consequence, uh, as long as the seeds can last a couple of years in the ground, uh, what we call a seed bank, um, we'll see our plants back here. So, so, uh, so the question is how tall do they get? And online, and for all of you here, um, this is almost life size. They would get to be about six inches tall. So that, that's what you're looking at. Over there last year. Yeah, last year. And I've been all over Hemlock Hill. For those of you who are online, we're at the base of Hemlock Hill. And we're going to do a walk and do a circuit to meet all these other parasites. And we'll actually come right back to here. But uh, I have not found them. And uh, I think it's been so dry. As we're going to see on our next stop, we're going to go right, just 100 feet away. We're going to look at a parasite that's, that basically taps right into the roots of American beech trees. It's called beech drops. And there are times when I can say I'm under some beech trees. There are hundreds and thousands of these beech drops. I found three this year. So I'm hoping again, their seed bank is, is, is alive and well and healthy. So. Yeah, so the question is, and this is a very interesting question. Do parasites have one host or do they have many hosts? Um, sometimes they have one primary host, but most of them actually uh, can hang out with a lot of different plants. So beech drops really are about beech trees. Um, but I'm going to tell you that when we get to the fern leaf false foxglove, which is kind of a mouthful, so uh, I'll have to keep practicing it. Actually, it has preferences, but there are probably 30 or 40 species it could tap into, which is really quite a talent because those are all different kinds of roots that it's, it's working on. So uh, great questions. We're gonna now walk over to see some beech drops. And again, the photographs, you know, only little brown guys like this. I'll have some photographs and some herbarium sheets, but follow me this way. And again, that's all that's left of our poor Indian pipes, but uh, they're really quite, they almost glow as Emily Dickinson really described. So for those of you online, I'll just let you know wherever you are, uh, we're in the Arnold Arboretum, sort of in the center of it. And what we're going to do now is we're going to walk. We're actually at the base of Hemlock Hill, which is to my right. And then we're going to walk towards the beach collection. We're laid out taxonomically. So uh, the, the beauty of this is if I want to find a lot of beach trees, I, I know where to go. And if I want to find beach drops, um, it's a good idea to go towards the beach trees. So we're just walking that way. It's a magnificent day here. It's probably the nicest day we've had in months. Uh, we've had the hottest, driest summer in recorded history. And today is just a perfect, wonderful temperature. Uh, sun's out, a little bit of clouds. Uh, you may see in front of you uh, a lot of water being pumped onto our beaches because of the drought. Uh, you can see a, a big fire hose. Um, we're still working to automate all of our irrigation here. 
Uh, but climate change is making it harder and harder to, to grow a tree. So uh, these are the challenges of having 16,000 woody plant accessions, 281 acres, and basically desert conditions for what are really music temperate wood, woody plants that like rain in the summer. So here we're going to go over here. And I'm going to give this back to you, Maureen, and we're going to go to that. All right. Nick, we do have an audience question about the last Sure, thing. go ahead. Yeah. So sure. the question is, I have seen pink Indian pipes. What is going on there? Um, the, so we had a question from online about seeing pink Indian plants. And they actually, they're, they're variable in color. Some are really white. Some of them are, are really pink. And, and I love the variation. It's just that they're putting out some pigments. I don't know why. But I think that's one of the reminders that you can have a species that has variation and actually you can really enjoy that variation. So here we are standing under a thicket of uh, American beech. Now, for those of you who are used to European beaches, you know, you have a European beech tree grows up, nice tall trunk. American beaches do the same thing, but American beaches do one more thing. As they send their roots out, the roots can develop new growing tips that are shoot systems. So these are root born shoots. A really great morphological trick. So this entire thicket behind me of beech trees is probably all derived from one plant's roots that just sent up these thickets. And they're really beautiful. So this is a great place to find uh, uh, beech drops. Now, the beech drops are not white. They're actually kind of brownish. And uh, I'm staring at them right in. Ah, point them out to me. I just saw them a minute ago. Ha, there they are. All right. <laughs> All right. You'd think a botanist could find beech drops, but if you look right here, do you see this beautiful plant? Now, this is capped directly into the host plant. And mostly you, you see uh, it's, it has no green to it. So it's stealing water, dissolved mineral nutrients, and carbon, sugar, photosynthetic product. Now, the beech trees, it's, it's fine. If there were a thousand of these under here, it wouldn't matter. Now, What's really cool about them, and uh, again, for those who are online, uh, this is a picture I took. There was one year where I did see a, over a thousand under one beech tree in its thicket. And uh, what you'll notice about them, since they're getting their water and everything else from the host plant, I actually dug some of these out and you can see they don't really have much of a root system. And that root system, when you look at it, actually doesn't do anything to uh, get uh, anything from the ground. It's just there to anchor them. So these make these really small, they're dust seeds, essentially. They scatter them all in here. And every year, you have just enough energy, if you're lucky enough to be near a beech root, to get just enough of a little root out the door, glue yourself to your host, and then dive in with a drill and uh, hook up to the water pipes and the sugar pipes. So if you, and I, I can dig this one out uh, in a second. I'm going to uh, put that down. But anyway, this is beach drops. And if you come back under any, there's a beach thicket over by our, uh, our composting area on Peters Hill. That's a really good place to scout them, but I haven't seen any. Now, uh, if you look at this, you can see down here, uh, the base of it. It's really, it's a really lovely plant, a little bit of purple color. What are these little things sticking out of the axis there? Those are the flowers. And beech drops does something kind of interesting. It's a, it's a strategy that actually uh, a number of plants do, uh, but I wanna just describe it to you. This has nothing to do with being a parasite, but it's just an interesting botanical thing. These flowers are really small and they never open. And you say, what? Well, what they're doing is they're saying, we are gonna take no chances on those pollinators. Reproductive assurance, we're gonna self pollinate. So these are called, uh, Clystogamous flowers, they never open, they self-pollinate. All right, and within the flower, the pollen will be, will be deposited on the female parts. Now, I'm gonna show you another picture of a flower that looks very unlike this. You can see it's a big tubular flower and it's open. And that is for outcrossing. So you wanna get a little bit of new genetics, you have two different kinds of flowers. I only see one on this one, but if we wait long enough, we might actually, if you come back in a week or two, you may see some later flowers and there'll be big tubular flowers. And those are designed to get some new genetics in. 
But even if they don't get there, these guys are going to set seed and they're going to set seed by the tens of thousands. They're so small, these seeds, that this, is, this one plant is going to produce a zillion seeds. So, uh, um, these would be insect pollinated. Uh, the tubular ones uh, would be insect pollinated. Uh, they're meant to be a little bit showy, as you can see with the purple stripes, and uh, and and the insects do find them. So here it is, beach drops. And if I was to scruff down here, I don't know that I can get down there far enough, uh, but you'd see a main axis. And then, like I showed you in that picture, boy, is it still dry here? Woo wee! Um, you can start to see the little tubercles. Uh, and then, if I was to go all the way down, I'd find a beach root, and it would be glommed onto it. So it's stealing the carbon and the water and the dissolved minerals from this plant. Now, I'll just tell you, biologically speaking, what's really interesting about these parasites that have to get, uh, uh, we got our, <laughs> so for those of you online, um, it's, uh, we're really busy. Our arborists are out here. They don't know I'm over here, but they're, they've got their big chipper machine on. <laughs> so we're gonna try to get them to turn that off. But this is life in the Arboretum. There's a lot of stuff going on. And uh, anyway, the thing is water moves through plants under negative pressure. It's being pulled literally up a plant. So if you were to measure the uh, girth of a tree uh, at night and then measure it at high noon the next day, the girth would be smaller because of the negative pressure. It's like being sucked up a straw. So if you're hooked into a plant that has negative pressure, you have to have more negative pressure generated to make the water go your way. So the, actually, there's a whole bunch of physiology around the trick of getting the water to move towards you. You just can't just tap in because it's being pulled away from you and you have to actually create the physiology that makes the water come your way. Oh no, it's just that it's been so dry this year. So the question is, why do we have so few uh, plants here uh, of the beach drops? It's just been a brutal year. My guess is that very few seeds germinated. Um, and when they did, they probably didn't have any water. So they weren't able to get to, because once they're hooked into the host, they're fine. But it, you, you know, there's, there, there's the, the seed and then there's hooking into the host. And if you don't make it, that's, now that's Darwinian. That's survival of the fittest or, survival of the luckiest, uh, depending on what your rain conditions are. So this is our second uh, parasite. Uh, oh, the question is, what can, when, do, when do these things flower? Since they're annuals, they'll flower every year. Every year when you see a plant come up. Oh, the big flowers, I don't know. It's a question is, when do they make the big flowers and do they always make the big flowers? And the answer is, I, I honestly don't know, but it's a great thing for you to observe. Uh, I think they're going to be more terminal, so they're later. The, the, the cell thing happens first just to make sure nothing bad go, you know, happens. But then uh, I don't see any big flowers, but there's a lot of little flower buds right there uh, that I can't tell you that they aren't going to be big. Yeah, August and September. No, they won't be. July is too early. August and September for beach drops is really the best time. So uh, that's when you want to look for them. So what we're gonna do, and for those of you who are online, you don't have to walk, you can just take another sip of water. If you're in Europe, you can have a glass of wine now. Um, but we're gonna head to one, I think is the most enjoyable and fun uh, hemiparasite at the Arboretum. It's one I stumbled on uh, a year ago, by accident, just walking. I saw this incredible yellow flowered plant. And it turns out it hadn't been seen at the Arboretum, formally documented in a hundred years. It was Curtis J. Palmer, who saw it last. And so we're gonna go for a walk around Hemlock Hill. So if you don't mind, yeah, yeah. Uh, the question is, is the beech drop native to New England? And the answer is yes, it's a perfectly good native plant and it'll hang out wherever there are American beaches. So you know, a lot of parks in North America. Great question. Okay, let's head towards the South Street Gate, which uh, for those of you who want a little history on the way, the South Street Gate was one of the two original gates installed at the Arnold Arboretum in the 1890s. Uh, has magnificent ironwork, as many of you will know, uh, and actually was designed by the architectural firm H. H. Richardson, which designed Trinity Church in downtown Boston. So some very, very nice high-end uh, 
kinds of things are going on there. Um, <laughs> oh, the tea station in Newton Center designed by the same firm. All right, there, I'm getting a little bit of history here. Behind, uh, as I'm looking out, maybe Amy, you can just uh, point to, uh, for a second, is the remnants of our beach collection. So you remember the drought of 2016, right? Well, we lost a lot of material. So we're replanting and we're, we're getting irrigation here as soon as we can, but it's been tough. <laughs> yeah, so the other thing I'm being reminded, uh, there's a new disease on beech trees called uh, beech leaf disease, it's a nematode. And uh, sadly, we just found it this summer at the Arnold Arboretum. We're not sure how to combat it. Um, it could devastate the beaches of North America. Um, the reality of growing a tree in the year 2022 is just, it is devastatingly hard to keep things alive. We have so many invasive diseases and pests. We have uh, the effects of climate change that uh, too much rain. What, last year, what did we have? We had way too much rain. We lost trees to actually flooded root conditions. This year we're losing trees to desert conditions. Um, it's just, it's endless. But I will say for those of you online and around me right now, the horticultural crew here has been nothing short of heroic. Uh, they have been working around the clock to get water, to make sure our trees are safe. Uh, they have not a single day during the pandemic did they not show up for work. They've been here every day taking care of plants. So here we are, we're coming over to uh, uh, the South Street entrance, beautiful old iron gates. And uh, to my right, a beautiful, uh, beautiful Dawn Redwood, uh, which is our iconic plant on our hats. I hope I'm pointing at the right spot of my hat. It was over here. I don't, I don't have eyes on the top of my head, but somewhere, somewhere up there, I've got a Dawn Redwood. Um, for those of you who don't know the history of the Dawn Redwood, it was thought to be extinct. Uh, it, and known only from the fossil record. We're gonna go this way. And then in the 1940s, it was reported in Hubei province in China that there was this unusual conifer that wasn't previously described in science. And lo and behold, one of the scientists who trained at the Arnold Arboretum uh, from China, uh, he actually described the species and we got the first seeds to leave China in 1948. We've got these magnificent trees here. So we're crossing over Bussy Brook uh, which is anything but a brook because of the uh, drought here, it, which makes it a little easier to get across. And we're going along a little footpath uh, at the base of Hemlock Hill, and I'll, I'll hand you that. And Hemlock Hill, um, maybe I'll uh, get us in here for a minute and just talk a little bit about one interesting thing about Hemlock Hill. I'll just wait. Looks like we've got a fair number of people here. Yeah. This, is, this is great. Yeah, sure. No, they're all individual uh, that are seeds. So each little patch is one different individual. Oh, the, oh, I'm sorry. So the question is all those thickets uh, that we see at the beach, those are all clones. Does that mean that they're not genetically, uh, no variability? They're, a gene they're totally the same genes. Uh, there is, uh, oh yeah, so could beaches uh, get, so actually they're, Mutation is something that happens all the time. On average, if you looked around us, each of us probably have 70 or 80 different mutations that neither of our parents had. Most mutations, you know, no problem. Uh, some can be a problem, but mutations are always going on. And that's true of plants too. Even when it's a clone, Even when it's a clone because what can happen in a, is the growing tip, the population of cells, they can have a mutation and then if they flower, they can put those genes into a seed. Some, yes. It, if you give the, uh, you know, for beach, all these diseases, you know, we have a very human perspective. Uh, you know, we don't want thousands or tens of thousands of years. There will be a conversation back and forth between a pest and it's what it's attacking and there will be evolved resistance. And that's, that's the long story of, of, of essentially evolution. So that's a really, really great point. Now, before we go to see this magnificent false foxglove, uh, which is a hemiparasite, I want to just mention something really special. If you look be behind you at the soaring uh, rock formations of Hemlock Hill, um, it's really a, a beautiful space. Now, most of the Arnold Arboretum was probably pasture and sheep. And when the Arnold Arboretum was begun uh, in 1872, you had some inholdings of natural areas like Hemlock Hill, some of our little woodlands, but mostly this was basically flat and treeless with little hills here and there. 
And um, yeah, you look at old pictures of the Yonglar region from the 1890s, Bussy Hill is just a treeless landscape. We're starting to put things in. So when you look around at all this lushness, that's, that's new. Now, before uh, uh, Weston uh, folks came in, uh, there were a lot more trees and Native Americans would have managed these grounds very differently. But I want to tell you an interesting piece of history. It's a beautiful spot to go to. Uh, you can see these towering dark hemlocks. And when they weren't under attack from the woolly adelgid, which is another invasive pest, um, this would have been almost dark, even in the middle of the day, just so thick. And guess who came here to think, to talk, and to converse? The American transcendentalists. And in fact, for those of you who know a little bit of this history, um, Margaret Fuller, who wrote one of the most important and fairly radical books on feminism uh, in the 1840s, she came here frequently. So again, yep, mm -hmm. yeah. So what you begin to appreciate is that, you know, when we're in a botanical garden or an arboretum like this, you go to places, not just for the plants, but because the plants shape what you think and how you feel and how you respond. And uh, it makes sense that someone who is thinking about transcendentalism and philosophy and our relationship with nature would find a place in this area that's wooded, it's beautiful, it's got topography, it's got the rocks, uh, and, and would spend time here. It's totally obvious, isn't it? So just a reminder that these spaces are more than just the accession trees. They have this other history and, and it's quite wonderful. So this is one of my favorite views actually is to the top of, of Hemlock Hill. Now, again, for those of you who are out in the Western United States, when we say hill, we mean 150 <laughs> feet. When we say mountain, we mean a thousand feet, okay? Uh, that would be just a slight roll for you. Okay, let's, yeah. Oh, E.J. Palmer, a while ago. Okay, was that, was that a person that was on the operator? Ah, uh, yes. So look, I'm gonna tell you over there, but a hundred years ago, one of our botanists, Ernest uh, Palmer, found the plant we're about to go see. He actually, I'll just show you right now. He made an herbarium sheet of it. He actually made several herbarium sheets of it. Isn't that wonderful? And there, the press plant, this is just, of course, a, a photograph I took of it, but you can see that he pressed this plant. And now let me read what's on the label. It says, spontaneous flora of the young arboretum, Oriolaria pedicularia, and RAF uh, is the uh, period. That's the person who named it. I can tell you what RAF is. It's Raffinesque, uh, who was a nutcase of a botanist, a uh, total wacko. Uh, I'm a big fan of his. He named more plant species than anyone in history. And it drove Asa Gray at Harvard nuts because they weren't all good species. So every time you looked at two plants, like if you had a pink monotropa and a white monotropa, almost certainly he was going to give it two different species names. So a lot of his names have gone but it turns out he named this one. And it says, Rocky Wooded Slopes of Hemlock Hill. Oh, nice. And guess what? When I found this, and then actually it was Andrew Kopinski, our director of horticulture, he said, I'm gonna go pull that herbarium record. And he said, you know what? It's been seen before, but not for a hundred years have we recorded it. So later this week, I'm gonna go out with our, our wonderful person who runs our herbarium. Her name is Davika. And uh, Michael Dosman, who is our keeper of the living collections. And I am going to clip one of these plants, which is fine because there's plenty of seeds. I'm going to put it onto an herbarium sheet, range it. We are going to make a label and 100 years pretty much to the year after we did our last sheet, we will add another record of this wonderful plant. So now that's not quite colorful. So let's go see some yellow flowers. I don't, the question is, are they endangered in Massachusetts? And they're not listed as endangered. And I don't believe they are, but they, they show up sporadically and you do have to keep your eyes uh, open for them. What a spectacular day. I just can't believe how uh, beautiful it is. So out of curiosity, Sarah, who's uh, running uh, the computers behind the scenes, I'm wondering if you've asked any, where people are from who are online. Oftentimes we get people from Europe and I'm curious if any of the uh, members of the Dendrology Society in Poland are with us because they were at one of my last programs. Um, I haven't asked anyone yet, but if anyone wants to say where they're from, you can enter in the chat. Um, you'll be able to, to message me directly, if not everybody else. But yeah, we would love to yeah, hear we'll just hear, you know. Yeah, I'd love to know where everyone is. We're, we're, by the way, for everyone online, 
this is not David Attenborough level production. Uh, we're just doing this with phones and, and um, earbuds and, and uh, just having a good time. But hopefully you'll, you'll uh, let us know where you're from and we're just trying to do more of these hybrid programs. Uh, and then I just need to pay really close attention to yellow flowers to my right. Uh, they're gonna be up there, right around that curve. So far we have a few people from different parts of Massachusetts, Central Mass, Concord, Cambridge, as well as someone oh. coming in from California and someone from the Netherlands. Oh, excellent, the Netherlands are here. That's, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, my last graduate student was, 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 is from the Netherlands. And so maybe, maybe it's connections through her, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, also have wow. College of the Atlantic in Maine. Oh, I have good friends up there too. <laughs> Aha! Aha! All right. Isn't that just beautiful? Yeah, and then there's a bigger one right there. And then there's a, another one, I think, down there. So uh, uh, you can see through Amy, uh, hopefully, that they're beautiful. They look like sort of like foxglove flowers. I'm not sure they're quite foxglovey. But they're beautiful. The fern leaf comes from the fact that their leaves are sort of like a fern leaf. They're small. And uh, these guys uh, prefer oaks. And if I look around, I believe you'll see right above me a rather large, probably a red or a black oak. And um, there's a root down there and these guys are pulling. So this is, you can gather around. The nice thing is we're gonna see another population in a minute, so we won't linger here, but I, if, yeah, no, but it's it's a different family, and so we're going to go to the uh, up uh, up the hill here, and we're going to find about nine of them. So there'll be plenty of access for you to look at them, because uh, these are just a couple of little guys. So feel free to linger, and then we're going to go around the corner up Plessy Hill, and then when we see that population, you can really stand back and see nine of these plants. They like sunny. Yeah. The question is, do they like sun? Yes. Certainly, certainly foxglove. And they're not fox gloves. That's the yellow one. So you can see right there. Um, Aurealaria, ridicularia. Yeah. And this thing is stealing water mostly. It's only typed into the water pipes. But in those water pipes, there is usually a little bit of amino acids and other kinds of organic acids. And we know because people have done the chemistry on it, you can actually tag which carbon comes from what. Yes, they are photosynthesizing, but we know that they have carbon from another plant. And if I was to dig down in there, I would find them attached. What, what box? There's, there's an oak here. There's an oak here. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's gone rogue. Uh, and then we've got, whoops. Yeah, and they can tap into a number of different things. So we're gonna go see a really nice population of these right now. And uh, it takes a little bit of a, we're gonna get our exercise today going uphill. <laughs> Yeah, it's wonderful. This is, the tree bobs are one of my favorite things. Um, for those of you online and who are around me, I came to the Arboretum in 2011, and I decided we had to have some more spontaneous fun here. So I decided we'd call these things tree mobs because they're sort of like flash mobs, but they're really more about the trees and having fun. And we just sort of pop them up and, and go. And I think we have probably 50 people here, which is kind of amazing. Uh, in the middle of the day. And we're now walking up uh, the backside of Bussy Hill on an old trail. And we're gonna be looking off to our right. To our right, can't miss them. And here they are, isn't this magnificent? So I, I was here with my wife who's a botanist and son of a gun, look at this. Isn't that the most beautiful thing? I mean, parasites are great stuff. And uh, you can look over to your right there. You'll see two more plants over there. One here and a bunch here. As you see, we have a little light gap here. So uh, they, they like to photosynthesize on their own. And again, uh, for those of you who want a close up of the flower, uh, they're really quite beautiful. You can see that some of them are still opening. So you can see little yellow balls. Those are the buds. And then they'll open up into this nice tubular flower. But again, one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven. I think there's two more I'm, I'm missing, but, but it's a nice little population. So what's been going on over the years? It's been drifting around Hemlock Hill for centuries. And you know, that's just an amazing thing. Yeah. So here's the deal. These plants have been on Hemlock Hill, we know from a century ago from the herbarium sheet in a different place. This says uh, just uh, rocky wooded slopes of Hemlock Hill. But another one says that they were on the other side of Hemlock Hill. Uh, I didn't find them there, but they disperse their seeds. If all goes well, these are usually annuals or biennials. So they can like, live two years and then they disperse their seeds. But if you imagine, you know, the last glacial maximum, the glaciers pull out about 18,000 years ago, trees start marching back into Massachusetts over the next 18,000 years. These things show up, they march up probably with their hosts. And these things have been bouncing around Hemlock Hill probably for thousands of years. Isn't that amazing? And there's a question, yeah. No, the question is how would you know that they're a parasitic plant? And the only way is to get into the scruff and actually to find it. And people were so interested in these plants. You know, when people were describing new species or they were doing the internal anatomy of plants, they would collect whole plants and then they would find out, oh, wait, this, this isn't just going anywhere. It's going right into another plant. And so the, 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 actually the last paper published, the scientific paper on the structure of how it hooks into the plants, 1902, a wonderful, beautiful paper from Japan and uh, it's about 40 pages long. It has the drawings from the microscopes and it shows exactly how these plants hook up. And you wanna know who studied it since? No one. <laughs> so the question is, did I just notice this population this year? And the answer to that is yes. I don't usually come up this back trail, which is a reminder when I'm at the Arboretum, you know, get off your beaten paths. And so I was, I was botanizing with my wife, the botanist, and we went to the other population I saw last year, which we found by accident. And then I thought, let's go somewhere we haven't gone before. And I want to go, and I wanted to find a trail to the last plant. And then we're just walking along and then I just about passed out when I saw this stuff. Uh, it was just so beautiful. And I knew we could actually then, we could do an actual tree mob and have, you know, not just two plants by the side of the path. So yes. How long do the flowers last? These are gonna start in late August. And I think you'll find for the next few weeks, they're gonna to continue to flower. If you look at the top, this is a hill. Um, there's still lots and lots of small flower buds here. So you're gonna see the uh, first flowers over a period of time will start to turn into fruits. But if you came back, I think in two or three weeks, you'd see perfectly good yellow flowers. And, uh, and I may sneak up here and grab some of the, of the fruits and dry down the seeds and then toss them somewhere else. Uh, you know, just trying to, I'd like to have more parasites in the Arboretum. And, <laughs> and, and don't quote me on that, right? I mean, the con but, uh, well, you can quote me on it. But here's what I will tell you about parasites. So these are barium sheets and uh, Maureen uh, can hold them up um, or, uh, over here. So I went back to the herbarium and I pulled uh, one of the big family that we're talking about here is the Orobankaceae. And I said, let's look at everything that E.J. Palmer collected. And there's one, there's a whole bunch. There are about four other species that I have not found here. They are native, but we've been doing a lot of, you know, we, we trample the grounds, of course. Uh, we also have a lot of places where it might've been a nice meadow, but hold on a second, we got an ambulance going by. <laughs> and for those of you online, the ambulance is not carrying anyone from the tree mob. So it's, it's all safe here. Um, so the, uh, there's a whole bunch, you can pass them around, but I just want you to know there are a bunch of parasites that probably as we did more lawn stuff back in the uh, last century, and you know, many of you will know we're turning many of our lawns to no mow zones and meadows, uh, much more beautiful. We do not need more lawn. Uh, but in the meantime, I've gone to some areas where I know from the herbarium sheets, these other species existed. There are purple flowered ones, yellow flowered ones like this, uh, cream flowered ones, pink ones. I would love to have all of them. So yesterday I wrote the uh, former botanist for the state of Massachusetts. They, had, they actually have a, a botanist for the state who's really trying to keep track of what's growing and also what's threatened and everything else. And I asked if he could lead me to some locations where I could collect seeds of the plants that we know were parasites here at the Old Arboretum. And I think what we'll do is we'll go gather that material 
We'll scruff some ground near their, their host, and hopefully we can reintroduce extirpated species that were native here, belong here, and should be growing here. Yeah, so uh, we're getting a, a note that you can really see there's a light gap here. Uh, around the corner, you saw these things growing and it was very light. And that's actually true at the right, most of the day, this is just sitting in a big bright spot. So they definitely, they definitely do not want to, they're not gonna be able to make it uh, with carbon from their host. They have to photosynthesize. Uh, and, and they they prefer sunny spots uh, for obvious reasons. So the, the question is, is, it, is this oak right here, the host? Um, and likely it is, but the fact is, this can tap into probably 20 or 30 different species of, of both, I think, woody plants as well as some herbaceous material, um, which is really, you know, we tend to think they're very specific. They have preferences, but they, they can do business with a lot of different species, and that's known for this one. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, the, the oak gall is not helpful to the plant, that's for sure. It's sort of a proliferation. So we're being asked, uh, we were next to one of these plants and there was an oak gall on a young oak seedling, um, but that would have nothing to do with this. It's just these trees get them. The gall is not parasitic, but it's certainly growing at the expense of the oak tree. I mean, it's carbon is coming from it. it yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to our last tree, and I'll be happy to answer the question. Uh, yeah. The question is, do they do damage to the tree since they're so small compared to a, a nice mighty oak? And the answer is uh, no, not really. Um, and in fact, a, a good parasite should not kill its host. If you think about it, you have this careful balance. If you're a parasite that kills your host, you die too. So parasites actually want to walk that line. These guys are little teeny wildflowers. This, this tree's got you know, thousands and thousands of leaves. So in fact, when we do reintroduce these things, you'll just see them scattered. They won't do any damage. And the lovely thing is they're really part of the actual ecosystem. So uh, you know, with mistletoe, sometimes you can push it a little bit too far with mistletoe, uh, but we don't have any mistletoe here. Yes, one more question. Ah, so the question is who pollinates these? And I don't know the answer, but if you can see, they're nice tu tubular corollas. So something is gonna get in there. There's, there may be some nectar at the bottom that they wanna probe with their tongues. Um, and they're gonna, if you looked actually up close, I can actually show you a picture. Right at the, uh, at the opening are the four stamens with the pollen. So if you're going in there, your, your head's gonna pick up the pollen and it's going to move it. If you go to another flower, you're going to move it right onto the stigma. So they're, they're insect pollinated and they're doing the usual tricks of saying, come over here, I'll give you something, you, you move my pollen. And, uh, and then these will all be very, I'm sure, especially because we have different individuals, there'll be tons of seed. And uh, so anyway, a hemi parasite, it's getting mostly water and mineral nutrients, but a little bit of carbon too. All right, now we're going to go to what is the oldest accessioned plant in the Arnold Arboretum. And it is the most nondescript thing you're gonna see. So there's no way I can get you excited about what you're gonna see except for the backstory. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna continue up Hemlock Hill. <laughs> All right, thank you. And what a beautiful day. Uh, I'm sure Amy's gonna show off a little bit of Hemlock Hill. The peak is up to my right. Again, mere. 50 to 100 feet up there, and you're in one of the highest places in Boston. Uh, the Arnold Arboretum actually has the second highest point in Boston with a beautiful view of the skyline. Um, and it's only, I think, a few hundred feet up. So it, we don't get very tall uh, around here, but this is beautiful topography. And we'll just make our way around. You can see some beautiful old hemlocks, but also you can see some other things, some yellow birches, uh, this is all sort of spontaneous in the sense that uh, other than the hemlocks we plant and a few other things, we just let it go. It's a, a sort of a native ecosystem. And we're going to bend to the right here, exactly. 
And Sarah, if you have anything from uh, those who are online and would have a question, I'm happy to answer it. So have a little bit of a walk. We don't have any online questions right now. So a reminder to everybody, I mean, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. All right. We're getting there. This is the uphill portion. We're not going to get 10,000 steps in, I don't think, but maybe 1,000. <laughs> Nice, but the, when this forest was at healthy, it would have been dark under here, just completely dark. Uh, Woolly Adelgid has just done such a terrible thing to hemlock forests all over the Eastern United States. Um, but we've been able to manage it with oils that we spray every year. So the trees are coming back. All right, so we're gonna go on this big trail. A lot of people run up this hill for cross country practice and stuff like that. And we're gonna go to the left. And the, the shrub we're gonna see, this is a woody plant actually, a shrub. Um, as I say, it's not in flower, it's pretty nondescript, but, <laughs> but it has a great backstory. So that's, that's gonna be the key to this one. All right. There's a nice hemlock with lots of cones on it. Sunflower making its way into the collections. Now I have to find my shrub around this bend. For those of you in the Netherlands or Europe, pour yourself another glass of wine. If you're in California, probably another cup of coffee or tea would be more appropriate. Uh, there we go. We're going to march right in here. All right, wow. Just knocks your socks off when you see it. <laughs> it's a shrub. <laughs> and we'll wait for everyone to gather. This is a parasite right in front of you. Yeah, it's the only one we have here and it has a great backstory. And we're, it's not as healthy as we would like. You can see we have shading, shade netting over it and we've got fencing around it so no one bumps into it accidentally. It's the first, it's, in terms of the date of collection, it's the oldest thing that's in the collection. And, I, and actually, it, it's got a great story. So we've got people still marching up Hemlock Hill and uh, coming to join us. I, hopefully, everyone was ready for a little walk today. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a platform for birds, owls. Yeah. Yeah, so we have, we have a lot of, we have raptor platforms. We have uh, places for owls to hang out. We're doing everything we can, you know, we're in an urban situation to really promote uh, not just the plants, but the animals uh, and the insects. Uh, uh, so, and actually when it comes to raptors, uh, we're very happy to have them because uh, we are not a fan of rodents when they chew up our plants. So, uh, you know, we, we like to think there's some natural sort of a rodent control that we can do. Okay, almost everyone's here. <laughs> So uh, was I right? This is kind of uh, you know an easy plant to walk by. Uh, you might not kind of go, wow, that's amazing. And uh, and it's as I say, it's on the ropes uh, a little bit. So, <laughs> but it it is a really interesting plant. The uh, shading is just because we think it's a little stressed, and we're trying to keep the light levels a little bit less. Um, we're we're just trying to figure out. It's a very old plant, as you'll see in a minute. Um, and it's just not thriving. Uh, you can see some dieback, and we've been pr we've pruned out. You can see it can suck her up and uh, so forth. No, there's, uh, that's a good question. It's probably pruning in this case. Um, it can be propagated uh, with cuttings, but probably we would be best off just collecting new seed. All right, well, welcome to uh, the uh, pirate bush is the common name for this. And this is the genus and species uh, Bucklea disticophila. Uh, meaning two rows of leaves, and you can see that uh, basically. 
Um, for flowers, it's not in flower right now. They're green flowers, not particularly showy, uh, but uh, if you were to come in the spring, you would, you would find them. Uh, and there are no fruits on this. And I'll tell you the reason is we have one specimen and this is a dioecious species. Dioecious means there are male plants and then there are female plants. And this I believe is a female plant, but the nearest male plant is probably somewhere down in the mid-Atlantic states. So it's very unlikely it's gonna get pollinated. We will never see fruit on it. Now, this is also a hemiparasite. It, it tends to love uh, hemlocks, probably the uh, Carolina hemlocks that would be in its native sort of uh, growth range, but it does fine with uh, Canadian, Canadian hemlocks, but it also can tap into other things. And um, the story on this one is a really fun one. So you may have heard, and there's a wonderful Arnoldia article. You can just go to Arnoldia, Google up uh, uh, the Bucklea plant. And uh, Richard Howard, he was the fifth director of the Arnold Arboretum. I'm number eight. And uh, after 150 years, I, I feel like I have another 40 years just to catch up with the rest, but I don't make it. Um, bottom line is he wrote a lovely article um, to talk about what, where this plant came from. So many of you will know Asa Gray, who was the great friend and confidant of Charles Darwin here in America. And he was the director of the herbaria, herbarium at, the, uh, at Harvard University. He was certainly the most eminent botanist uh, in America, and he had a huge correspondence. He became the first person to advocate Darwin's theories of natural selection and evolution. Uh, he, had, uh, he, he did everything he could to promote an evolutionary worldview, even though as a younger person, he had not yet himself embraced evolutionary ideas. Once he saw the power of the Darwinian uh, paradigm, uh, he became this wonderful friend and colleague and part of an army of people who spread the word. But he was a great botanist and he had heard about this, uh, this hemiparasite, uh, which grows in the mid-Atlantic region um, and it's sporadic. Uh, and he himself went in 1843, Asa Gray collected this specimen. Now, Interestingly, there's no Arnold Arboretum in 1843, but there is, of course, a botanical garden. Harvard had a botanical garden, and sadly, they uh, bulldozed it uh, in the 1940s, and it's uh, on Garden Street. If you're in Cambridge, there's a bunch of graduate student housing, no brick housing. Um, that was where there was this magnificent botanical garden, which is, and if you go there still, there's a beautiful female ginkgo tree there. If you stand under that and, and get a little bit of the ginkgo smell on you. It, it's one of the most fecund trees you'll ever see. Um, so this grew in Cambridge from 1843 until the 1940s uh, in the Botanical Garden. It was hooked into uh, uh, Hemlock up there. But with the impending uh, uh, ra you know, raising of the uh, Botanical Garden and its beds, the decision was made to transfer this 1843 Asa Gray collected Bucklea to the Arnold Arboretum. So this has been growing under this spot. So of course, what would have happened is they say, well, they love Hemlocks. Uh, well, you know, they may come from a region that's a different species of hemlock, but they'll probably do well here. And in fact, for the last almost 80 years, this rather nondescript shrub has been stealing water and a little bit of carbon from our hemlock. So almost, uh, almost, uh, you know, now let's see, 1843, almost a 200 year old shrub right in front of you. Uh, so we take a lot of care. One of the things I, I, I think we can reflect on here, which is really important, every specimen at the Arnold Arboretum is a living object, an individual, it's unique, and it deserves our respect and our care. So even though you might say, ah, oh, this isn't the showiest thing in the world, we know its backstory, we know where it's from, we know whose hands have been on it. And we are working quite a bit of the time just to figure out how to keep it happy, dial in the conditions, let it grow back, get a little bit of health, and maybe we'll do an expedition and find it a mate one day, who knows? So that ends my formal program on the parasites of the Arnold Arboretum. I'm happy to take a few questions, but for those of you who are online or ready to go to the next thing, don't feel bad about going off and I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes, you're welcome. Like transplanting a parasite must be an extremely difficult process because you've got to detach it from its original host and put it in a condition where it's likely to find another host? That's a, this, that's a great question. So here, the, or comment, really, this has got to be tricky. It's living on something already where it's got all of its roots hooked in. And so I was curious about the, the transplant. I haven't found records. That doesn't mean they don't exist about what they did, but it's not in the uh, article in Arnoldia. But my guess is they would have gone and excavated around. They would have cut out with the host root, at least still in there, so they wouldn't disturb anything. And then they would have really looked, scruffed around in the soil to get it near some hemlock roots 
uh, and hope that, you know, because they can photosynthesize, even without a host, this can go for a while. There are many of these hemiparasites. You can grow them in, 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 in a, in, in a you know, without their host. They'll go for a while. They're not going to be as happy as they would otherwise be, but they can, but you really wanted to get it. And I think that's exactly what they did. But I, I was wondering the very same thing. So great question. Yes. Yeah, so the question when we were over by the beaches and we had a, a big rain can and water can uh, watering is how do we decide whether to let plants go on their own or give them some help? And this is actually a really interesting thing. You'll see gardens oftentimes have massive irrigation systems. Every week the water's on. That is not the best way to grow trees. We want trees to experience regular drought because that means they will grow more vigorous root systems because if you give them tons and tons of water, they don't need a lot of roots. They're, they're, they're not gonna grow. Them. So in fact, we only put water down when we reach extreme drought where the plants with global change and the climates and the three inches of rain in 11 weeks, these are, exper these are experiences in terms of environment these plants didn't evolve. So what we're doing is we're putting down enough water to get them to not die. Uh, but once we get a bunch of rain back, let's say in the next week, a few storms roll through, the, the ground is saturated, we won't be irrigating anything. Um, we don't wanna use water uh, uh, recklessly. And in fact, we are only doing it because we have an obligation, an ethical obligation to keep these plants alive for, for conservation value, for their own aesthetic. Um, but we, there are years where we wouldn't even turn on a single, like last year, remember what is, summer I can remember, uh, trust me, we did not have to think about water. We were trying to get rid of it. <laughs> so great question. And that's all about how we manage things. And there are parts of the Arboretum, we have about a third of the Arboretum now under irrigation. Um, the next big project on Peters Hill is gonna begin next month uh, so that we can get water there in the next extreme drought. And then in the next couple of years, it's my job to get the funding to get the irrigation to the rest of the Arboretum. We Growing a tree here in the 1880s is not the same thing as growing it in 2020. This is a fundamentally changed game. The number of diseases, the more extreme conditions, the freeze thaw cycles that we're getting off through the spring that have really bad effects. It takes twice as much work to grow a single tree as it did even 20 years ago. So it's one of the great challenges. And then you think we have 16,000 of these we got to keep track of. So our crews are just always out there looking. Did this get water? Oh, the, quite quickly, uh, did this one get watered this summer? I don't know the answer to that. It might have. Yes. I'm guessing in the wild and happy, uh, they might get up to 10, 12 feet. I mean, you can see some of the uh, bases there. It looks like they're about two inches in diameter. Um, like It seems like it's, it's roving around. You can see it's probably um, putting up, I'm guessing these are root-borne shoots because there's some distance there and this is all one plant. Uh, and you can even see that we cut one back, but it looks like it's alive. I can see a little bit of green coming out of it. And we're just gonna hope, fingers crossed, next spring some bud comes up and uh, this gets a little bit more bigger. Oh yeah, so right behind me is a hemlock tree that's dead. So, you know, what's interesting is what if this thing is tapped into that? Well, uh, there's a white pine over here it could tap into and there's, and then there's another hemlock there. But you're right, you know, these are the kinds of things you can imagine. Um, this might've been killed by woolly adelgid, all right? And so that then has all these effects that, that filter out. That's a great observation. Yes, we still spray for woolly adelgid. In the initial phase, when we thought we were gonna lose everything on hemlock hill, it was just gonna be wiped out. Uh, we were using chemicals to treat, but we knew uh, we didn't wanna sustain that for the long haul. So we're now using uh, what are oils, the same kinds of things you can use in your gardens uh, that really just make it hard for the uh, woolly adelgid, but that's not a long-term solution. So one of the things I asked our horticulture and, uh, uh, folks to do is the following. We know that where woolly adelgid has marched through whole forests and everything's been killed, there usually are a couple of trees still standing. And if you think about it, they may be genetically already partially or entirely resistant. And so what we did is I asked uh, the keeper and the, the horticulture, director of horticulture, get us clonal material of those uh, Canadian hemlocks and seed. So, you know, so there'll be some genetics in there. And we've put in over, I think, 150 of these, what are called bomb proof or bulletproof hemlocks. And we're just gonna find out which ones uh, get attacked and which ones don't. 
to the extent that we find a few that are moderately or even you know, pretty resistant, we will make sure that we get those documented. There's work at the University of Rhode Island, I believe on this, and we're gonna to try to get those out uh, into the horticultural world so that you can plant and not have to treat. So uh, that's the long term. What? It was being balanced when it was screened. Yep. Running down. They'll grow up in the back. They'll be so. Yeah, we're just talking about how many places we can think of, like in the Blue Hills where the hemlocks are gone. I can tell you, northeastern Connecticut still has around the Yale Myers Forest. Uh, you can drive country roads there and it's dark. And it's a very uplifting feeling to be in a part of the world where there's still the, the sense that you're in a real hemlock forest that hasn't been devastated by an invasive pest. But that's that's the reality of it. It's, it's it, This arboretum has got, there's a million pests waiting a month. And if they're not here now, not only is it coming over from Asia or overseas, but think of all the things that are in the Southeastern United States that don't normally live up here, but as it gets warm, their zones just expand. So. All of this is going to mean that we're, going to, we're just going to get more and more of this. Yes, Nancy. I just wanted to say about this plant. Um, she's a food study over here a few years ago, and I can remember seeing this plant, and it's huge. It's like, you know, something that you've had in your garden for five or ten years, and you've got other kind of things in your garden. So mm -hmm. I'd like to look at this plant. It's yeah. massive and shrubby, so it's, I'm not sure what all the factors are, but when we looked at it, Yes, it's it's a shrinking plant, but there are some nice vigorous shoots in here, and the fact that there's some more, I think they're root suckers, uh, you know, gives me hope. And again, the keeper of the living collections, the director of horticulture, our, our manager of horticulture, the crew, they're all aware of this. I mean, even though you might not notice it from the trail, we're keeping a close eye on it. And part of it is not only is it a, a, a really interesting plant, but you know, it has that history back to the botanical garden, to Asa Gray, and it has a great backstory as so many of our plants do. So, you know, we want to get it to, you know, it's 200th birthday is what I would say, which isn't that far away, right? 2043, we'll be here, you know, with cake and everything else. <laughs> Ned, we do I think it's some... a female. We do have some online questions. Run it up here by UPS. Yeah, so the question, I'm going to get some questions from online in a second, but the question is, could we get pollen from a plant uh, in its nat natural environment and do the pollinations? And the answer is yes, and that's often what we'll do. Uh, but you'll say, get me some pollen, so I'll go out and collect it, dump it, dump it in an envelope, and then we'll get a paintbrush and, you know, do a little uh, you know, pollination on behalf of the insects, and, and uh, then we could get seed set. So I I'll ask our keeper and our director of horticulture, uh, whether we might want to do that and see what the, the fruits look like. They're sort of droop-like uh, fleshy fruits. They're good size, as I understand it. Uh, so let's take some questions from online. I'll repeat them for everyone here. We actually just have the one right now. It says, how do you prioritize collecting a mate for plants in the collection that don't have one? Uh, so the question online is, how do we prioritize collecting a mate for plants that don't have a mate here? Well, mostly, uh, most of our plants are not just one of the species. We usually have multiples. And most of our plants are not dioecious. They are, you know, hermaphroditic flowers. So, and so and most plants here are pretty happy. Um, if I had to think about, is there any other dioecious species that has male and female plants that we have only one specimen of? Um, there might be, I don't know. Uh, this is the only one I know of. Um, but if we were gonna do it, we would, again, we would write our colleagues uh, uh, that are at universities and botanical gardens or herbaria that are in the areas where they might be able to collect some stuff tell them to send us some stuff, uh, you know, just in UPS and, uh, overnight or whatever, and then we would pollinate. And I think it's kind of fun. Now that I think of it, I think we ought to do it uh, and uh, see what, and then maybe we should get it a mate. Uh, you know, now that I think about it, it does feel, maybe that's why it's declining. I mean, you know, loneliness is a tough thing. I mean, there's been a pandemic, this, this poor shrub. So anyway, that, that's the answer. We would just get pollen and we would have someone send it to us. You had a question? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's called pirate bush because it's stealing. And it's not even a very common name. So oftentimes you don't even see it referred to as pirate bush, but that's what I've seen online. And uh, it seems like a good good idea. And uh, so that's what, you know, how, what we know about it in terms of how it hooks up to things. Uh, it's stealing. But I don't think it killed this hemlock. <laughs> All right, well then I've, I've got to head back and uh, 
you'll all walk down, but thank you for your attention. It's been lovely to be together.